Lord Lamont, Norman, welcome to Lord Speaker's podcast. Can I start with your early life? You know, you started in Shetland. Now, it seems a long way from a boy in the most northerly part of the United Kingdom uh, to the city and to Westminster. How did you start in, in Shetland? Well, my father was the surgeon. When I say the surgeon, I mean the only surgeon. He did everything. <laughs> I think today there are several surgeons in Shetland and, you know, he had a very active life, getting on boats, going out to see people. Um, I went to school there, stayed there till I was, I think, 11 or 12. Um, then we moved to Perthshire. But growing up in Shetland was a great experience. I mean, it uh, very cut off. Um, hard life really for many people there, um, closer to Norway than it is to Aberdeen. <laughs> um, Joe Grimmond was once asked, what's the nearest railway station? He had to fill in a form. He said, Bergen. <laughs> so I think actually in a funny way, Shetland is less Scottish than many other parts of Scotland and has an, some people, many people there have an affection for the concept of Britain. I think I'm a very strong unionist, but I think that's partly affected, partly by having been born in Shetland. Yeah, in fact, I think at the time of the referendum in the Scottish Parliament, Shetland had a different point of view from the rest of Scotland. They, they didn't want the, the devolution, that, that's right. Um, and... Uh, Shetland also, in the referendum, I, were you referring to the, parl the referendum about the Scottish Parliament? Yes, the yes. EU In the EU referendum, not the 2016 one, but the one that Harold Wilson yeah, had, yeah. Mm -hmm. that they were the only part of the UK that voted not to join the EC. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was given for that, rather jocularly, was that the government published a pamphlet setting out all the advantages of joining the EEC and they had a map on the front of the British Isles and Shetland was not included. <laughs> Good and I've always had the impression that Shetland and, and other uh, islands you know felt that Edinburgh was a long way away and maybe that... Yeah I think that's absolutely right that's what I was trying to say they look to London as much the same as Edinburgh really and you know I think many people there did have a feeling of being British as well as being Scottish but a strong feeling of being British. And then you went to Cambridge uh, and your friends there Michael Howard and uh, uh, other uh, individuals you know uh, Lee in Britain you were a good friend of his. Uh, what was your experience in Cambridge like? Then, but you, you seem to be the front line uh, people. Were you all going to make Prime Minister? <laughs> I don't think so. I think uh, we, we all w wanted to get involved in politics. I don't think we thought about becoming Prime Minister, or certainly I didn't. Um, I think that I was always very interested in politics. Uh, my mother was very political in Shetland. I mean, she was a supporter of the Conservative Party in Shetland, which had a bigger vote then than it does now, even though it wasn't, uh, it was still a liberal constituency. And she used to take me to political meetings in Shetland. They did have such things. I mean, I remember being by my mother's side where Sir David Maxwell Fife, I think he was then Secretary of State for Scotland, spoke in a village hall in Shetland, <laughs> an abiding memory. But I went up to Cambridge interested in politics. I wouldn't say I was a die-hard conservative. I joined the Liberal Club, the Labour Club, the Marxist Society and the Conservative a Society. Marxist. And, and the <laughs> European Society as well, um, to look at all viewpoints. But uh, I remember I met very much Kenneth Clark and John Gummer, Lord Deben now, and got drawn into them. And I, I decided I had more in common with the Conservatives. Um, I had quite a long flirtation with the Liberals, actually, because of my connection with Joe Grimmins' constituency. Um, but I became aware of politics more. I think, uh, I thought, shall I become a journalist when I leave? Shall I be a civil servant? I thought the world of public affairs was exciting and something I wanted to be involved in. And then gradually the thought occurred to me that maybe I could actually get involved in politics. and. 
you know, I have all these friends, as you say, Michael Howard, Leon Britton, uh, Peter Lilly, um, John Gummer, Kenneth Clark. Um, you know, we all we all tended to be on the McLeod wing of the Conservative Party, very much liberal conservatives, rather against the ancien regime. Our views since have dissipated, and we've all become different. But uh, in those days, we were all McLeod McLeodists. But I think in the union debates at Cambridge, we sort of found our feet and found our identity. Uh, and Ted Heath, you know, uh, famous for her entry into Europe. What was your opinion at that time? Did you have a different opinion from him? Well, I supported joining the EEC, as it was then called. I made my maiden speech, um, and I had a go at Enoch Powell, who was opposing it. And, uh, uh, and I, Michael Foote? Michael Foote was opposing it. Yeah. But uh, Enoch Powell, I had heard speak at Cambridge um, once in favour of joining the EEC. Now, when I was in Parliament, he was opposing it. So I made a little bit of fun of how I'd been converted to being pro-EEC by Enoch Powell. And he was very generous about that and very nice to me afterwards. But that was my maiden speech. Um, and I believed at that time in joining the European Economic Community. I believed in the free trade area. You know, my shift to uh, Euroscepticism and supporting Brexit was really because, as I saw it, the nature of Europe changed. Ted Heath, uh, you don't get many people who say a good word for him these days, but I have to say at the time I admired him. He was a contrast, a bit of a breath of fresh air with the old-fashioned ancien regime we'd had. He was um, you know, a big contrast to Sir Alec Douglas Hume, a very honourable man, but gave an impression of being something of an amateur, whereas Heath was a master of detail. I think the Conservatives chose him as leader of the Conservative Party, really because they thought he was the only person who could take on Harold Wilson, who was a great mastery of detail. Heath didn't have Wilson's debating skills, Wilson's wit, but he had this great grasp. And uh, although I subsequently became disillusioned with what happened with Heath's policy and disagreed with some of it, I admired his sense of purpose, his determination that uh, Britain should not get into a cycle of decline, Britain needed to be modernised in all sorts of ways. He was quite a radical person. I remember Richard Crossman, the Labour cabinet minister, gave a series of lectures at Harvard where he talked in awe about Ted Heath. He called him the battering ram of change. He was just so amazed that Ted Heath could get so much done. Unfortunately, Ted Heath got into this terrible situation with the miners, um, which led to chaos, the three-day week, and led to his eventually losing the premiership. But not to go into that in too much detail, but that was all very much caused by, I think, the monetary policies of Ted Heath, the expansion of the money supply, the, the prices inflation. And income, prices and income Yes, policy. we, in a futile attempt to deal with it, rather than tightening monetary policy, chose to have a statutory prices and incomes policy. I mean, people today can hardly believe that we used to have laws that regulated the price of milk, regulated the price of bread or anything. Anything in the shops was subject to legislation. And this, of course, couldn't possibly work in a free market economy. And, you know, that also, f he fueled inflation. And you know, although uh, I felt that the unions had to be tamed somewhat, in one sense, the unions were reacting to the inflation. Yeah, yeah. But you were the youngest MP... Uh, youngest Conservative. Conservative MP, 1972, if I remember. But your first contest was against John Prescott, uh, and obviously he won. What was it like uh, engaging with John Prescott at the time? Um, well, he was quite distant. Um, you know, I, I thought he was to be honest, surprisingly edgy. I mean, he beat me by a small, narrow majority of 24,000 votes, so he didn't have much to worry about. Um, but uh, I remember he kept denouncing me and wasn't very friendly at the count, but I subsequently got to know John a little in, in, in London and in the House, and I like him very much, and I respect him, and I think he was a 
uh, a very good MP who brought a lot to politics, and I can see why it was important to the Labour Party. I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah, but there is a lot of respect for him. It, you then joined the Treasury, I think, in 1986, and you were there for about seven years, uh, and you had a close engagement with Nigel Lawson. Sadly, he just died recently. Give us a feel uh, for that engagement and what you learned from Nigel Lawson. Uh, well, I'd known Nigel Lawson really ever since I left university. I joined a political club that he was a member of in London. I'd got to know him over political dinners. And also I worked for a while before I became an MP in the Conservative Research Depart Department. And Nigel was working there, sort of rather part-time, I think. I think it was while he was also editor of The Spectator, but he was speech writing, first for Alec Douglas Hume and then for Ted Heath. And I, I got to know him then. I also got to know Nigel in, in a strange way. I was in competition with him to be the Conservative candidate for the constituency of Blaby for the 1974 election. And this selection took place in 19... 72. And the shortlist for the constituency was Nigel and me. And the selection committee, very wisely, I'm sure, absolutely wisely, chose Nigel instead of me. But I got into the House of Commons before Nigel because a few weeks later I got picked for a by election in 1972. And Nigel sent me a charming postcard saying, I'm so pleased I did you a wonderful favour by defeating you. Maybe I should just say, people to this day get very puzzled by why Nigel was in favour of joining the ERM, because people associate the ERM with the single currency, and if you, that it was a dress rehearsal for the single currency. Nigel did not believe in the single currency. He was not a European federalist, a European unifier. He did support joining the EC, but he didn't support a political Europe. But he believed that by linking your currency to a hard low inflation currency like the Deutschmark or like the ERM generally, which was a currency grid, your inflation rate would eventually converge with that of the low inflation rate countries. So it was after the period when monetary uh, supply controls, control of the money supply, had failed, proved too difficult as a, a guide for policy. That was what the Conservatives did originally in 1979. They set money supply targets, but money supply proved very difficult to control, very difficult to measure. And Nigel moved to the position of thinking exchange rate targeting was the answer to controlling inflation. And that was why he wanted to join it. Yeah. <coughs> The exchange rate mechanism, that features a lot in your political life and uh, John Major supported you at that time, but I think there was a parting of the ways after that relationship uh, and your views uh, on it. Could you give me a Yeah, well, the exchange rate mechanism, the fixed exchange rate system, uh, it was John Major as Chancellor who joined. I, I played no part in it. I know most people seem to think I invented it. Um, uh, you know, and I carried out the policy. Actually, when Nigel resigned, I was asked in the House of Commons by Giles Brandreth at question time, why haven't you resigned at the same time as Nigel Lawson? And I replied to him, because I don't believe in joining the ERM. Well, that was a rather ironic thing, because I became the Chancellor of the Exchequer eventually, who had to implement our policy of being in the ERM. Um, you, you merely need today to mention the words ERM to Conservative MPs, and you get a shudder. They think it's all. But actually, uh, although I personally would not have joined the ERM, and although I personally didn't think it was a disaster when we had to leave. Uh, I think the sh period we were in the ERM for two years did actually do the economy a huge amount of good. It did precisely what Nigel Lawson uh, had thought it would do. It lowered inflation very dramatically. I mean, when I became Chancellor of the Exchequer, on the day I became, inflation was nearly 11%. Shortly after I left, inflation came down to 2 or 3%. It, it was painful, it was 
uh, tough medicine, but it really worked. And the period after we left the RM, the period after I was Chancellor, ushered in the longest period of growth. I think there were 60 quarters of positive growth. Now, a lot of Conservative MPs mistakenly say, oh, that's because the pound was devalued. It wasn't just because the pound was devalued. It was because interest rates came, came down and inflation was now super competitive. We had inflation below the level of Germany for the first time for many years. And that was why we had this long boom, the main beneficiary of which was uh, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. But when Conservatives say the ERM was a disaster, I think it was a political disaster. It was a great humiliation. But we would never have had the growth that we subsequently had if we hadn't actually had the discipline of being in. But it was a good thing we got out because it couldn't have gone on forever. William and Haig, William Haig and I did a visit to Japan, just the two of us. And one morning uh, we went out running together and he said to me, interest rates are 8%. We went upstairs, showered, had breakfast, and then he said to me, interest rates are about 12%. He says, given that I'm the PPS uh, to the Chancellor, do you think I should fly back? <laughs> I said, I think that'd be a good idea. <laughs> uh, as a result of that. And it, it, that was a really uh, turbulent time. What was it like being in a room at that time? Because your memory and that has still Well, you're going back to the ERM. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's a complicated story, but you know, I, people often say, what was it like? What did you think? I didn't have time to think about it. I just had to do what we had to do. Um, a, a number of countries were under pressure in the same way, and they all put up interest rates. So we had to go. The, the day started off, interest rates were 10, not 8, 10 percent. We put them up to 12. Um, and I said to John Major, the game's up. We will have to leave the ERM. But unfortunately, um, various cabinet ministers didn't agree. Douglas Heard, Michael Heseltine, Kenneth Clark, and they formed a committee with the Prime Minister. And they insisted, really, that I put interest rates up to 15%, which I didn't want to do. I said it'll have no effect. Anyway, in order to... You didn't, yeah. I, I put them up to 15% mm. and it had no effect, and then we put them down, down again. Straight, yeah. But it didn't look very pretty, and it was very stupid. You were derided for that at the time, but uh, some economic historians would say that uh, you gave birth to inflation tracking and public debt uh, element, and that's what was a catalyst for the, as you say, the economic situation which Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, ushered in? Is yeah, well, I mean, thank you. I mean, I'm well aware now opinion is swung a bit, 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 not unanimously, but a bit back more in my favour um, uh, or in favour of, of what actually happened. Um, after we left the ERM, I mean, we'd gone from control of the money supply to targeting the exchange rate. We had to have a new policy, and the policy which I introduced, I didn't invent it, it had already existed in New Zealand, was that of having an inflation target. I was a bit um, sceptical when we first introduced it because inflation targeting, which is targeting a specific rate of inflation, two to four percent, we introduced it, and then it became two percent. It's essentially backward looking. You're looking in the rear mirror. But uh, of course, when you're trying to fight inflation, you have to look forward as well. So I never abandoned looking at the money supply as well. I, when I introduced inflation targeting, I did at the same time argue and say that we should have regard to the money supply as well, which was more of a forward-looking indicator of that. But the amazing thing is that inflation targeting, until very recently, has worked extraordinarily well. I mean, people are, at this moment, uh, very critical of the Bank of England, and inflation has gone through the roof, but, you know, due to a lot of factors outside anybody's control. Um, 
But over the whole period since inflation targeting was introduced, the 2% target has been hit for most of that time. It's only recently it's gone astray. Well, your views on QE and the Bank of England and independence of the Bank of England, give us your views on that. Well, I was very much influenced by Nigel um, and became strongly in favour of an independent Bank of England. And I don't wish to make a point against John Major, but he and I had some disagreements about interest rate policy. And I felt sometimes he wanted to subordinate interest rate decisions to political factors. And I felt politics should have nothing to do really with, you know, you can't time an interest rate because there's a by-election or you've got a closing of a mine that you want to distract attention from. And I, I did feel that from what I'd seen inside government, not just under John Major, but even under Mrs. Thatcher, politics intruded into interest rate decisions. And I felt this was wrong and led to bad policy making. And so I was a strong supporter. I tried twice to persuade John Major that we should make the Bank of England independent, but on both occasions he rejected it. And I did actually go and see both Gordon Brown and Tony Blair when they were in opposition, and I told them that uh, it wasn't my business to do anything to help the Labour Party, but I think it would be in the interest, thought it would be in the interest of the country if they made the Bank of England independent. I remember Tony Blair said to me, you don't understand the Labour Party, they'd never accept it. And the day before Gordon Brown announced uh, that he was making the Bank of England independent, he did ring me up. Uh, and he said, well, we've decided to take your advice. <laughs> so there you are, okay. Uh, your less guarded moments in some of the comments you made, like the green shoots and Je ne regret rien and singing in the bath. Tell me about them. Singing, singing in the bath actually was slightly misreported. Um, I didn't sing on the bath the day we left the ERM, but I think it was two or three days after we'd left the ERM. I was strolling in the garden in the British Embassy in Washington because I had to go to the IMF. And I forget which interviewer it was, but someone caught me and they said, you seem very cheerful this morning. It was a very sunny day in Washington. And I, someone said, you seem very, very cheerful. And I said, well, it's funny you say that. My wife heard, says she heard me singing in the bath. That was the, <laughs> the, the, the remark I made. Um, I didn't say I sang in the bath when we left the ERM. Um, Je ne regret rien. Well, that was a sort of, I was asked a question by a journalist. Um, what do you regret more, singing in the bath or seeing green shoots? And I replied, je ne regret rien. How do you reply to a question like that? <laughs> but it, the role of the House of Lords, uh, it's been questioned that, you know, there's wanting reform. Some people think that Gordon Brown want root and branch reform, uh, assembly uh, of the nations and regions. Uh, what merit does the House of Lords have with its present composition and the, the different membership from the House of Lords, from the House of Commons? Well, I think the House of Lords is a reforming chamber and it is also a chamber of people of experience and expertise. And I think a second chamber is, I think, important. Uh, I know there are countries in the world that have unicameral one chamber government. But I think the House of Commons doesn't always scrutinise legislation as carefully uh, as it should. And I think it's important to have proper scrutiny. I think the House of Lords does, does that well. Um, if we were starting from scratch, completely green field, I don't think one would design the House of Lords as it is today. I think ideally it would be 200, 300 very eminent experts, um, probably elected and maybe on a regional basis. I don't mind about that. I think that's the Gordon Brown plan. But I don't think it's very easy to get there from where we are now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, you know, all the talk about the House of Lords is too large. Optically, it does look too large, but you know as well as I do that in fact there are sort of 400 people or so who are yeah. here a lot of the time. Also, 
the people who come occasionally make a valuable contribution. I once had a very interesting remark from Mrs. Thatcher. Uh, I asked her, what do you think of the House of Lords? And she said, I think those who come the least often make the best contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if you think of somebody like Lord Brown of Maddingley or the Astronomer Royal, who come occasionally and make very outstanding speeches of great expertise. I, I think there is a role for them. But you know, people look at this theoretically very large number. I personally thought the scheme that was introduced by your predecessor and was observed by Theresa May of gradually reducing yeah. the numbers, I personally thought that was very sensible. I strongly support it. As I say, ideally, if you were staying, starting from scratch, I think we'd have a much smaller house and I think it would be elected. But we're never going to get to that stage very easily without having a constitutional convention, cross-party agreement. So I would stick with what we've got now, but lower the numbers. But it does require discipline by prime ministers not to appoint all their cronies and friends. And I, th I think prime ministers have got, you know, a bit loose with the appointments that they've been making. There have been too many of them. I think it's also important that you don't just make into members of the House of Lords people who are sort of would-be MPs. You know, being a member of the House of Lords is different from being an MP, and I don't think people should treat this place as though they were constituency MPs. How has the House of Commons changed since your day? Because some would say that the House of Commons now is a chamber where little scrutiny goes on. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I, I sort of used to wonder whether this was really true, but looking at some debates in Hansard of the House of Commons recently, I've been shocked at how truncated uh, some quite controversial legislation has been, and key amendments have had sort of half an hour's debate or an hour's debate, and a reply from the minister lasting 10 minutes. Um, I think the use of the guillotine and timetabling is really very reprehensible. So I think the House of Commons has changed, but I think the House of Commons has changed in all sorts of ways. Uh, it has also changed. I think there are, to be honest, too many professional politicians there. And when I got into the House in 1972, I think the house, I would guess the average age of the House was much older, and there were people who'd served in the war. People who uh, didn't necessarily have an ambition to be a minister were content to be a constituency MP and do their service to the, the country. And it was a more stable assembly, really. I, I think in many ways politics become more volatile, more unstable in the House of Commons. And it's not always an attractive sight. You're a really strong proponent of Brexit. I mentioned earlier you were an early uh, person in that area. But I get the feeling from what you said, engaging with Tony Blair and, and Gordon Brown, John Smith uh, and others, that you're reaching out now. And I was quite struck by the initiative you undertook at Ditchley Park, uh, where Peter Mandelson and others were there. What was the reason for that, given we've got Brexit? Was it to ensure that Brexit worked and political parties came together? Well, the, the invitation, I, I, as I understand it, the whole thing was the idea of Peter Mendelssohn. I mean, I was invited by Ditchley to go to this gathering to uh, discuss Brexit and the future relationship. But it, it didn't, I wasn't advocating uh, any modification of the trade and cooperation agreement or modification of Brexit. What, what I strongly believe in, I mean, I believe in Brexit strongly, but I believe that we should have a strong, harmonious relationship with the EU as a third party. Um, and I think that's perfectly possible. And I think the fact of Brexit, the fact that it happened, you know, caused a lot of angst and a lot of bitterness and you know, there are people within the EU who, I mean, Donald Tusk was reported as saying there was a special place in hell for those who'd voted for Brexit. I think we've got to overcome this and work together. And I believe that 
even though we are an independent nation state and a third party to the EU, there are areas like foreign and security policy where Britain can play a leading part in the continent of Europe. Our security concerns are shared with the EU. Britain played a leading part. Uh, I think one of the benefits of Brexit was the greater agility we have in foreign policy. We were able to act more quickly and send arms more quickly while France and Germany were agonizing over this and agonizing within the EU. The EU eventually got its act together, mm -hmm. but 27 countries, it inevitably took a, a lot longer. And uh, I read the other day, uh, someone in Brussels said, well, if, if Ukraine had been relying on the EU, the Russians would have been marching all over. Britain was the first off the mark. But, but all I wanted at that gathering at Ditchley was to explore different ways in which we could um, improve our relationship, show that we were friendly, that we want to have partnerships in all sorts of areas like Horizon, for example, that, that's all it was about, all it was about. Can I just say for me, Brexit was not really about economics. It was about sovereignty. It was about independence of this country. I mean, while I was chancellor, I negotiated our opt-out from the single currency. And I lived through this whole thing. And I saw how you, the nature of Europe was changing. And before I think I became a minister, I believed this was all rhetoric. It wouldn't really happen. All this stuff about a United States of Europe, a political union. But my experience as a minister was that they were deadly serious about this and wanted it to happen. And we were going to become more and more politically integrated. And that would undermine our democracy at home. And that's what I feel to this day. And so, you know, I don't agonize about Brexit and worry about the economic consequences. I think the economic consequences will be fine. But for me, the prize was avoiding political union. Yeah. <clears throat> During major premiership in the 90s, we had the Maastricht Treaty and John Smith was very prominent in that area. What was your opinion of the Maastricht Treaty? Because well, it caused the, a lot of division in the Conservative Party. Yeah, well, the Maastricht Treaty, if you remember, was the treaty that had the single currency yeah. provisions in it. So when, when I say I negotiated uh, our opt-out from the single currency, I was negotiating part of the... Um, well, I was negotiating our opt-out from the single currency uh, from the Maastricht Treaty as regards the single currency. So I thought, as Mrs Thatcher put it, the Maastricht Treaty was a bridge too far. It wasn't just the single currency. There were other provisions like an integrated policy on security, defence. Well, all, some of this was amended. But we then had the Maastricht Treaty followed by the Lisbon and Nice treaties. And for me, that was all far too much. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Mrs Thatcher. What was it like working with her? Um, well, I always got on well with her, but you know, Mrs. Thatcher, you know, it was her willpower that was so remarkable and her courage. Um, you know, she would sometimes just ask questions no one had thought of asking, why don't we do this? Why isn't this possible? And she was a person of great integrity, I would say, as well. She never did anything dishonourable, never wanted to do anything dishonourable. Very clear about what she wanted and an inspiring person to work for. But she could be very difficult. <laughs> 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 what, what was your most difficult engagement with her? Well, I remember once, if I can tell a, a story, it's rather a long story, but um, she... Uh, was once came back to this country and told me that uh, she wanted to subsidize film studios in Rain and Marshes on Essex. And uh, I couldn't believe she wanted to do this. And I said to her, but Prime Minister, I didn't believe that we wanted to subsidize industries. Prime Minister, there's no unemployment in Rain and Marshes in Essex. Prime Minister, we have to build the roads together. And she got anger and anger and anger. And I remember she said to me, you're impossible. All you ever say to me is no. And then she said, 
If you'd been in my government since 1979, I wouldn't have achieved anything. And I said to her, well, Prime Minister, you always write about everything, but you're forgetting I've been in your government ever since 1979. <laughs> Very good. Uh, what advice have you got for a Conservative government now? Well, I personally think that Rishi Sunak's pursuing the right policies. I would say stop quarrelling, stop bitching with each other, support the Prime Minister. He's the best Prime Minister you've got. He's a serious, highly intelligent person. Any country would be proud to have him as Prime Minister and back him. Last question. Uh, given your longevity in parliamentary life and your comments about the House of Commons and the House of Lords, what advice would you give to young people about embarking on a political life? Well, I would, I always encourage young people to think about having a career in politics. Um, I think we all need to be interested in politics. I was taught at school that the Greek word for idiot was apoliti, somebody who's not interested in politics. I think it's the duty of everybody to be interested in politics. And I think our country will only prosper and do well if people of ability and talent who might succeed in other walks of life are prepared to take the risks. And there are risks in a political career and you risk your reputation. It's a very dangerous job being a politician. People have got to be prepared to do that for the public good. And I like to think that there are people who will always feel this is a challenge, it's a great thing to do and that they're going to embark on it. And apolity, that will stay in my mind. So thank you very much, Lord Lamont. It's been very, very revealing and engaging.